What do you hope for? And when have you ever felt despair about something? In this talk, I will speak about hope and despair. First, what they are as passions, and then how they are something that can actually be voluntary. So today we will talk about the passions of hope and despair first, and then hope or despair as something voluntary, as well as the sin of presumption. For an overview of the passions, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, go to the first talk, Passions and Virtues in a Time of Distress, or visit my YouTube channel, To Mystic Studies. Now, let us begin again with the latter part of a prayer attributed to St. Thomas Aquinas. O God, grant that I may never falter, whether in prosperity or adversity, so that I may not be puffed up in the one, nor downcast in the other. Let me rejoice over nothing except what leads to you, nor grieve except over what leads away from you. Let me never desire to please or fear to displease any one but you, O Lord my God, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Now first, I would like to recall a bit what we have learned already concerning the concupiscible and irascible passions, and then focus more on the irascible ones. In the sensitive appetite of our soul, we have two kinds of powers, concupiscible and irascible, by which we experience two groupings of passions, the concupiscible passions and the irascible passions. Again, a passion is a kind of movement in which I undergo an impression from some object. If you recall, the concupiscible passions concern the simple opposition or contrariety of good or evil objects which is called the contrariety of object. Love, desire, and joy are concupiscible passions regarding what is perceived as good. And hatred, aversion, and pain or sorrow are concupiscible passions regarding what is perceived as evil. Now the irascible passions, however, in addition to the contrariety of object, good or evil, which is seen again in the passions of love for the good or hatred for the evil. There, besides that, there is also there in the irascible passions a contrariety of approach to or withdrawal from a difficult object. That is, the approach or withdrawal is seen as arduous or difficult. The object is arduous or difficult. And so the irascible passions, in addition to the contrariety of object, good or evil, also have a contrariety of approach toward or withdrawal from either a difficult good that is, or a good that is difficult to obtain or an evil that is difficult to overcome. In other words, the irascible passions are specified particularly by an object that is difficult or arduous. Now, if we consider the contrariety of approach or withdrawal as being nestled, as it were, into the contrariety of object, then with respect to the good, we have the irascible passion of hope with re that regards a future arduous good which is possible but difficult to attain. And this is opposed to despair, which has to do with a future arduous good that is considered as being impossible to attain. And then with respect to an evil object, we have the irascible passion of daring insofar as one approaches the evil in order to overcome it, because it is perceived as something that is possible to overcome. And the passion of fear we have insofar as one withdraws or flees the evil because it is viewed as being impossible to overcome. There's also that passion of anger, which I will discuss later, 
I would just say here that for Aquinas, anger does not have a proper contrary. Anger is that tendency to attack an evil in order to take vengeance upon it. And this passion concludes with either the concupiscible passion of joy, if one has succeeded in achieving vindication, or sorrow if one fails. So the irascible passions are all related to the concupiscible passions, in that they presuppose the concupiscible passions. That is, they may presuppose a love or a hatred for something, since the irascible passions presuppose the seeking of some good or the avoidance of some evil. And the irascible passions also always must terminate or end up in a concupiscible passion, such as joy or pleasure or sorrow or pain, depending on whether or not the good sought has been attained or the evil has been avoided or overcome or not. Now, besides that contrariety of object and the contrariety of approach, each irascible passion, with the exception of anger, also has at least one contrary passion. However, hope and fear each have two contraries. Hope, although it is directly opposed to despair, is also opposed to fear, because hope is a motion toward a difficult good, whereas fear is a flight away from a difficult evil. So this means that fear itself has two contraries, because although fear as a motion away from this difficult evil that one cannot overcome is directly opposed to daring the motion toward a difficult evil precisely in order to overcome it. Yet, as I just said, fear is also opposed to hope, since fear is a flight away from the difficult evil and hope is a motion toward a difficult good. So knowing how the passions are related or opposed to one another can help us know better which passions we can cultivate in us to help us counter counteract some others. So to counteract our fear, we should cultivate both hope and daring. And I will discuss that more next time. For right now, let us talk more about these irascible passions of hope and despair. First, hope. Aquinas reminds us that the species or kind of a passion is taken again from that object. Now, in the object of hope, he says, we may note four conditions. First, that the object of hope is something good, since, properly speaking, hope regards only the good. And in this respect, again, hope differs from fear, which regards evil. Secondly, it is future. For hope does not regard that which is present and already possessed. In this respect, hope differs from joy, which regards a present good, whereas hope is for a future one. Thirdly, it must be something arduous and difficult to attain. For we do not speak of anyone hoping for trifles, says Aquinas, which are in one's power to have at any time. And in this respect, Hope differs from de desire or cupidity, uh, concupiscence, which regards the future good absolutely. So it belongs to the concupiscible, uh, the desire, but hope belongs to the irascible faculty. Fourthly, says Aquinas, this difficult thing is something possible to obtain, for one does not hope for that which one cannot get at all. And in this respect, again, hope differs from despair. It is therefore evident that hope differs from desire as well as the irascible passions differ from the concupiscible. And for this reason, moreover, hope actually presupposes desire, says Aquinas, just as all the irascible passions presuppose the passions of the concupiscible faculty. So again, according to Aquinas, the object of hope is the future good, considered not absolutely, which would be simply the passion of love, but as arduous and difficult of attainment. Now, just as evil is a privation of a good that ought to be there, and hatred is a privation of love, 
So the passion of despair is also a privation of hope. Although, as Aquinas notes, despair implies not only priv a privation of hope, but also a kind of receding or withdrawal from the thing desired, by reason of its being esteemed impossible to get. Hence, despair, like hope, presupposes desire, because we neither hope for nor despair of that which we did not desire to have. And for this reason, too, each of them regards the good, which is the object of desire. So in hope, there is an approach or a certain stretching out of the appetite toward the good, as St. Thomas says, where the future good, again, is seen as possible though difficult to attain. But in despair, there is an, a, a kind of withdrawal from this future good because it is seen as impossible to obtain. And interestingly, Aquinas gives an example of these passions of hope and despair as we see them even in certain non-rational animals. He says, if a dog sees a hare, that is a, a rabbit, or a hawk sees a bird too far off, it makes no movement towards it as having no hope to catch it. Whereas, if it be near, it makes a movement toward it, as being in hopes of catching it. Because the sensitive appetite of non-rational animals, and likewise the natural appetite even of insensible things, is always a result of a certain apprehension or perception of an intellect, just as the appetite of the intellectual nature in us, which is called the will, that is, we perceive something good and possible to obtain with the intellect, and so our will naturally experiences some movement towards it. But there is a difference between us and non-rational animals, in that our will is moved by an apprehension of the intellect in the same subject. I am the same subject who both knows and desires or hopes for something. Whereas the movement of the natural appetite in things without sensation results from the apprehension of the separate intellect who is the author of nature, that is God, who, who moves things that, that do not move themselves. And also the sensitive appetite of the non-rational animals who act from a certain natural instinct. So they have a kind of perception by which that helps to move them. So just Aquinas has said that uh, there is a kind of love, analogically speaking, even in things without sensation, insofar as they are directed by the divine intellect, who is God, to certain ends, and also a passion of love in sensitive animals, insofar as they are directed by instinct and a kind of sense knowledge. So there is also a kind of hope in these things and a kind of despair, at least in the non-rational animals, when they are aware that they are unable to obtain a certain desired object. So now I will turn from, to uh, hope and despair as objects of the will, that is, our intellectual and rational appetite, an appetite that is driven by reason. And insofar as these hope or despair are voluntary, St. Thomas explains that the act of the virtue of hope cannot belong to the sensitive appetite, since the good which is the principal object of this virtue is not a sensible but a divine good. Of course, we are body-soul composites, so our passions are not completely isolated, generally speaking, from our will, and there is usually a kind of flow back and forth between, or even a joint action, of the sensitive appetite and the intellectual appetite, known as the will. But properly speaking, hope as a theological virtue resides in the will, and its opposite vices are despair on the one hand, and which is a voluntary defect or privation of the hope that one ought to have, and presumption on the other hand, as a sort of uh, excess or abuse or misuse of hope. So Aquinas begins his treatment of hope as a theological virtue, 
that is voluntary, as a theological virtue. In the Segunda Segunda, the second part of the second part of the Summa Theologiae, and he begins by giving a definition of virtue from Aristotle. He says, the virtue of anything is that which makes the one having it good and also renders his work good. Consequently, says St. Thomas, wherever we find a good human act, it must correspond to some human virtue. Now in all things which are measured and ruled, the good is that which attains its proper rule. So we say, for example, that a garment is good if it neither exceeds nor falls short of its proper measurement. But human acts have a twofold measure. One is, the, is proximate and homogeneous, he says, that is the reason, our human reason, while the other measure is remote and excelling, which is God. So every human act is good, which attains to human reason, a, a right reason, or God himself, because our human reason is a kind of participation in the divine reason, which is the eternal law. So the act of hope, says Aquinas, attains to God, that is the act of the theological virtue of hope. For the object of hope is a future good, again difficult but possible to attain. Now a thing is possible to us in two ways, first by ourselves, or secondly by means of others. So insofar as we hope for anything as being possible to us by means of the divine assistance, our hope attains to God himself, on whose help it leans. Therefore it is evident that hope is a virtue, since it causes a human act to be good and to attain to its due rule or its due measure. That is, insofar as we are trusting in God, we are hoping in His assistance and grace. Now, just a note about what St. Thomas means by the rule, attaining to the due rule. He explains that the nature of virtue is that it should direct man or woman to good. Now, moral virtue is properly a perfection of the appetitive part of the soul, that is our appetite, in regard to some determinate matter. And the measure or rule of the appetitive movement in respect of the appetible or desirable objects is the reason. So our passions must be guided by the reason and be in conformity to it. So the good of that which is measured or ruled consists in its conformity with its rule, this kind of rule or standard, which in this case is the human reason insofar as our reason is following God's law. Thus the good things made by art is that they follow the rule of art, says Aquinas. Consequently, in things of this sort, evil consists in discordance from their rule or measure. Now this may happen either by their exceeding the rule or measure, or by their falling short of it, as is clearly the case in all things that are ruled or measured. I may have a garment that is too large, it's in excess of my measurement, or one that is too short because it is in defect of my measurement. Hence, says Aquinas, it is evident that the good of moral virtue consists in conformity with the rule of reason, human reason, which again is a participation in the divine. Now it is clear, continues Aquinas, that between excess and deficiency or defect, the mean is equality or conformity. So it is evident that moral virtue observes the mean. So again, moral virtues observe a mean that between that excess or defect, and this mean is to be in conformity with the rule of reason, which is itself in conformity with the divine reason or the eternal law. Aquinas gives an example of something being in accordance with the rule of reason. When it is done, he says, where it is right, when it is right, and for an end or intention that is right. There will be excess if one tends to this when it is not right, or where it is not right, or for an undue end. 
and there will be deficiency or defect if one fails to tend where one ought and when one ought. Now, of course, this all depends on the particulars of the actions and circumstances. So the virtue of prudence is necessary to inform our intellects, to know how to, we ought to act and to guide our passions. But here we are speaking of hope, which is a, again a theological virtue rather than a moral one. So the observance of a virtuous mean is a bit different because a theological virtue has God as its object, and so it cannot really be excessive with regard to the object itself, although it can be excessive with regard to us in a way. St. Thomas explains, The mean of virtue depends on the conformity with virtue's rule or measure, insofar as one may exceed or fall short of that rule. The measure of a theological virtue is twofold, or in two ways. One is taken from the very nature of virtue, and thus the measure and rule of the theological virtue, again, is God himself. Because our faith is ruled according to divine truth, charity according to God's goodness, hope according to the immensity of his omnipotence and loving kindness. This measure surpasses all human power. So we can never love God as much as he ought to be loved, nor believe and hope in him as much as we should. Much less, therefore, can there be excess in such things. Accordingly, the good of such virtues does not consist in a mean, but increases the more we approach to the summit. However, the other rule or measure of theological virtue is by comparison with us. For although we cannot be born towards God as much as we ought, yet we should approach to him by believing, hoping, and loving according to the measure of our condition. Consequently, it is possible to find a mean and extremes in the theological virtue accidentally in reference to us. Now, what does Aquinas want to say here? Well, as I mentioned, the rule in a theological virtue, whether faith or hope or charity, is God himself, who is also the principal object toward which each of these virtues tend. But Aquinas says that although hope has no mean or extremes as regards its principal object, who is God, since it is impossible to trust too much in the divine assistance, yet it may have a mean and extremes as regards those things one trusts to obtain, insofar as a person either presumes above his capability or despairs of things of which he is capable. What one hopes to obtain from God, Aquinas says, is eternal life, which consists in the enjoyment of God himself. For we should hope from him for nothing less than himself, since his goodness whereby he imparts good things to his creature, is no less than his essence. Therefore, the proper and principal object of hope is eternal happiness. So, St. Thomas notes that just as faith makes us adhere to God as the source whence we derive the knowledge of truth, since we believe that what God tells us is true, hope makes us adhere to God as the source whence we derive perfect goodness, insofar as, by hope, we trust to the divine assistance for obtaining happiness, that is, eternal happiness with God. And I should add that charity, according to Aquinas, makes us adhere to God for his own sake, uniting our minds to God by the affection of love. Now, as I mentioned, the extreme opposites of hope are the vices of despair and presumption. Let us look first, then, at despair. Aquinas teaches that, according to the philosopher Aristotle, truth and falsehood in the intellect correspond to good and evil in the appetite. Consequently, every appetitive movement of our soul, which is conformed to a true intellect, is good in itself while every appetitive movement, which is conformed to a false intellect, is evil in itself and sinful. 
Now the true opinion of the intellect about God is that from God comes salvation to mankind and pardon to sinners. According to Ezekiel chapter 18, 23, I desire not the death of the sinner, but that he should be converted and live. While it is a false opinion that he refuses pardon to the repentant sinner or that he does not turn sinners to himself by sanctifying grace. Therefore, just as the movement of hope, which is in conformity with the true opinion, is praiseworthy and virtuous, so that contrary movement of despair, which is in conformity with a false opinion about God, is vicious and sinful. So the problem with despair is that it involves a false opinion about God, thinking that either he will not forgive me, or even when I repent, or that he cannot save me by his grace. And this is a lie from the devil himself. And yet, it is one that we are often prone to believing. And Aquinas explains that not only is voluntary despair a serious sin, because those sins which are contrary to the theological virtues are in themselves more grievous than others, since the theological virtues have God as their object, and so the sins opposed to them imply aversion from God directly and principally. Insofar as it is voluntary, despair is a serious sin. But also, he says, despair is more dangerous than other sins, since hope withdraws us from evils and induces us to seek for good things, so that when hope is given up by despairing, men rush headlong into sin, he says, and are drawn away from good works. Therefore, a gloss on Proverbs 24.10 says, If thou lose hope being weary in the day of distress, thy strength shall be diminished. And it says, this gloss says, Nothing is more hateful than despair, for the one that has it loses his constancy both in the everyday toils of this life and what is worse in the battle of faith. And Isidore, Aquinas says, says, To commit a crime is to kill the soul, but to despair is to fall into hell. Now, again, we are speaking of voluntary despair, which St. Thomas says may arise either from too much love of bodily pleasures that leads one to have a distaste for spiritual things and not to hope for them, or Despair may also arise from the vice of sloth or acedia, which is a sadness concerning the spiritual goods. Aquinas explains that the fact that a man de deems an arduous good impossible to obtain, either by himself or by another, is due to his being over downcast, because when this state of mind dominates his affections, it seems to him that he will never be able to rise to any good. And since sloth or acedia is a sadness that casts down the spirit, in this way despair is born of sloth. So this is the danger of giving in too much to sorrow or sadness, because it weakens one such that a person may despair of God's help or of being able to obtain the everlasting good and happiness of heaven with God's assistance. For, adds St. Thomas, when one is influenced by a certain passion, he considers chiefly the things which pertain to that passion, so that one who is full of sorrow does not easily think of great and joyful things, but only of sad things unless by a great effort he turn his thoughts away from sadness. So one must make a great effort, with the help of God's grace, to trust in him, to turn away one's thoughts from the kind of sadness that leads to the false view of God. And one way to do this is to consider all the good and favors that God has already given 
and wants to continue to give to each one of us and to be grateful for these goods and trust in his continued love, mercy, and assistance in our times of difficulty. So let us turn for a moment then to the opposite vice, which is presumption. Aquinas explains that, as stated with regard to despair, every appetitive movement that is conformed to a false intellect is evil in itself and sinful. Now presumption is an appetitive movement since it denotes an inordinate or disordered hope. Now this is not the theological virtue of hope but is a disordered passion of hope which is voluntary. Moreover, presumption is conformed to a false intellect just as despair is. For just as it is false that God does not pardon the repentant, or that he does not turn sinners to repentance, that is the false conclusion of despair, so also it is false that he grants forgiveness to those who persevere in their sins, and that he gives glory to those who cease from good works. And it is to this estimate that the movement of presumption is conformed. So Aquinas teaches that properly speaking, presumption is not an excessive hope, as though one could hope too much from God, but it is because it is not the true virtue of hope at all, since it is expecting forgiveness and glory without repentance and without doing good works. But rather, presumption arises from either the vice of vainglory or from pride. St. Thomas teaches, Presumption is twofold. One, whereby a man relies on his own power, when he attempts something beyond his power as though it were possible to him. And such like presumption clearly arises from vainglory, for it is owing to a great desire for glory that one attempts things beyond his power, and especially novelties which call for greater admiration. This kind of presumption perhaps would be a kind of Pelagianism in the spiritual life, where we try to obtain a heaven without God's grace and assistance. The other presumption is an inordinate trust in the divine mercy or power, consisting in the hope of obtaining glory without merits or pardon without repentance. Such like presumption seems to arise directly from pride, says St. Thomas, as though one thought so much of himself as to esteem that God would not punish him or exclude him from glory, however much he might be a sinner. So this kind of thinking, of course, is a false understanding regarding God's goodness and denies the fact that we must truly repent of our sins in all sincerity, even though we may fall in weakness, we must still always be sincere in repenting each time we fall. Seeking to do what is good, then, and in accordance with God's will. So Aquinas teaches that, in fact, that we are commanded to hope in God and in His assistance, to bring us to eternal happiness with Him. This is not optional. St. Thomas says, Just as the precept of faith had to be given under the form of an announcement or reminder, so too the precept of hope in the first promulgation of the law of God had to be given under the form of a promise. For he who promises rewards to them that obey him by that very fact urges them to hope. So, hence all the promises contained in the law, the divine law that God has given his people, are incitements to hope. And St. Thomas uh, teaches that hope does not trust chiefly in the grace already received, but hope trusts in God's omnipotence and mercy, whereby even he that has not grace can obtain it so as to come to eternal life. So even a sinner who is not at the moment in the state of grace can turn to God 
by God's grace and then receive further grace from him. So whoever has faith, Aquinas says, is certain of God's omnipotence and mercy. So if we really have the theological faith, we must believe that God is omnipotent and merciful. And if God is omnipotent and merciful, then we must hope in his omnipotence and mercy to save us by turning to him sincerely and trusting in him and in his assistance. Therefore, says Aquinas, in order to be saved, it is mankind's duty to hope in God. And what kind of hope are we talking about? I can have a voluntary hope of obtaining various things, such as completing my doctorate, but here we are talking about a hope that proceeds from the theological virtue of charity, which is a love for God. St. Thomas explains, Hope and every movement of the appetite proceed from some kind of love, whereby the expected good is loved. But not every kind of hope proceeds from charity and from the merits caused by charity, but only the movement of living hope, that is, where one hopes to obtain good from God as from a friend. So we are called to practice this virtue of living hope in God. It is a hope that is living because it is alive with the charity which comes to us from God. Consequently, hope both precedes and leads to charity, as well as proceeding from charity. Aquinas explains that in, order, in the order of generation, hope precedes charity, for just as one is led to love God through fear of being punished by him for his, for his sins, so too hope leads to charity, inasmuch as one, through hoping to be rewarded by God and to have eternal life with him, is encouraged to love God and to obey his commandments. On the other hand, in the order of perfection, charity naturally precedes hope. Wherefore, with the advent of charity, hope is made more perfect, because we hope chiefly in our friends. For Aquinas' charity is the friendship with God. According to Aquinas also, the gift of filial fear is the gift of the Holy Spirit that corresponds to the virtue of hope. So let us pray then to the Holy Spirit for the gift of filial fear, which the scriptures say is the beginning of wisdom. Since by this gift, it is not that we fear that God may fail to aid us, or, or even that we fear his punishment, but rather we only fear that we may withdraw ourselves from his hope. It is a fear out of love, a fear of children for their father. Let us seek then to subject ourselves to the divine will out of reverence for God and to avoid separating ourselves from him, trusting in his power and mercy to save us from our sins and to bring us to the everlasting happiness of the, div of the vision of God himself and of union with him in heaven.